Hey guys, Kenny here. So we're going to continue looking at properties of matter. Um, again, there may be some parts here that you're familiar with already, but hopefully we're inducing a little bit of new material for you as well. Okay. So let's go ahead, jump right in and get started on our kinetic molecular theory and the properties of matter in terms of how it behaves. Hopefully you understand the atomic mass, atomic number, these basic pieces, the subatomic particles, and the fundamental forces of the standard model that we talked about last class. Okay, so essential questions. Number one, what is the kinetic molecular theory of matter of this entire presentation? I personally think this is the most important takeaway. So make sure that you know what the kinetic molecular theory of matter is. And two, what is the relationship between intermolecular forces and temperature? And this can be drawn out of the kinetic molecular theory. So if you can answer these two, they are the most important for today. Um, numbers three, four, and five here are good information and we'll use it, but also you want to make sure that um, if you go on to take chemistry, these end up playing a bigger role and you'll go ahead and see them again. What is buoyancy and how does it relate to density? What units does Boyle's law relate? And what about Charles' law? And then how does Bernoulli's principle relate to lift in an airplane? So key vocabulary. We went over this last class, but there's a couple others thrown in here uh, that we didn't go over last class that you should remember from your freshman physical science or from biology. Number one, an atom is the smallest component of an element characterized by a sharing of the chemical properties of the element and a nucleus with neutrons, protons, and electrons. And then remember, the electrons are not in the nucleus. They surround in the electron cloud. Number two, molecule, the smallest particle of a substance that retains all the properties of the substance and is composed of one or more atoms. So you can have a molecule of water, H2O, that's still two different elements, uh, but when they're bound together in this format that makes one molecule of water as opposed to an atom still needs to be just oxygen or just sodium, something like that. A mixture is a substance that contains more than one kind of matter. Uh, and they're physically combined more than chemically combined when we look at the mo molecule of above. Matter is a very general term for the substances that make up all of the observable physical objects. Typically, we're referring to atoms and molecules. An element is a substance that can't be broken down into simpler substances by chemical means. So this is carbon. We're going ahead and looking at um, things like oxygen is another example here, because you can still have O2, which is a molecule of oxygen, uh, but it's still an element because it's just one atom, one type of atom, just an oxygen atom, Other than, unlike water, which wouldn't be an element because water is a compound, which is the next one we'll see here because it's made out of, of two different elements, hydrogen and oxygen. Compound, two or more elements chemically combined to form a new substance with different properties. Okay, when we go ahead and take a look at hydrogen, hydrogen burns. Oxygen is needed for fire, but if you combine them together, it makes water which puts out fire. So definitely have new emerging properties. Ion this is an atom with a group of atom or a group of atoms that has an electrical charge. Uh, cations are positive ions, anions are negative ions, but these have gained or lost electrons to become in that state. And then yesterday we went over isotope, our last class isotope, and this is going to be something that has an extra or fewer neutrons than the number you were originally looking at. There are three main types of matter um, when we go ahead and start looking at phases. Uh, but here we're going to go ahead and look at the concept of an element, compound, homogeneous, and heterogeneous mixture. Remember, homo prefix means same, hetero prefix means different. So homogeneous mixture is a mixture that contains more than one type of matter, that contains only one type of matter. Uh, and is the same throughout, so it's evenly distributed. Now, I don't love this, you know, soda pop as an example, okay, uh, or air as an example necessarily, because if you start losing bubbles and moving things around, it may not be as homogenous. Uh, and if they mix the chocolate ice cream, it could be good. That, but that's probably a better example um, than the soda pop is. Heterogeneous means that they're not evenly mixed and lots of different types of matter. Um, chicken soup is a great example of this. Uh, you got to be careful when we start looking at these kind of mixtures of suspension, right? Um, 
soil, fudge, ripple, ice cream, these types of things. Element is very specific. These bottom two, I really want you to pay extra attention to because for what we're doing, that's important. A substance that contains only one type of atom, copper metal, oxygen gas, liquid nitrogen versus a compound, which contains more than one type of atom, table salt, rust, carbon dioxide gas. Okay, so most of the matter you're gonna find on earth comes into three different forms, solid, liquid, and gas. You probably are familiar with all of these. A solid holds its shape and doesn't flow. The molecules in a solid vibrate, but on average, they don't really move far from their place. A liquid, however, holds its volume, but not its shape and it flows. Uh, the molecules in a liquid are close together as you can be in a solid, but they have enough energy to exchange positions and move around their neighbors. Liquids flow because the molecules can move around. They're not in a crystalline structure. And lastly, a gas flows like a liquid, but can expand and contract to fill your container. So gas does not hold its volume and it does not hold its shape. The molecules of gas have enough energy to break completely away from each other and are much further apart than molecules in a liquid or a solid. Now, notice that we tried to kind of look at these from a perspective of what their physical properties are, but also in terms of the energy involved. And if we take a look at them in terms of their composition, remember that solid is rigid, has a fixed shape and volume. Liquid is not rigid, has no fixed shape, but it does have a fixed volume. And that a gas is not rigid, has no fixed shape and no fixed volume. So at this point in time, I'm gonna show you a little video about the kinetic molecular theory. And then we'll talk a little bit about what that means in terms of the particles and how that relates to average kinetic energy. In this video, we'll look at the kinetic molecular theory of matter. The kinetic molecular theory of matter states that matter is made up of a large number of atoms or molecules that are in constant motion. If we consider a gas, there's a large amount of energy in the particles, so they're in constant motion. There's also a large space between the particles, atoms or molecules. And because of this large space, there's little to no interaction, or attractive interaction between the atoms or molecules. If we consider a liquid, in a liquid, the amount of energy in the particles, the kinetic energy is less, so the particles are moving at a slower rate. They can slip past each other, but unlike the constant random movement that we see in gases, the movement is gonna be considerably less. There's also a smaller distance between the particles than in a gas, but greater than what we'd expect in a solid. This smaller distance between the particles, the atoms and molecules, allows for stronger attractive forces between the particles. This will limit the volume. Often we consider that the volume of liquids is constant under normal temperatures and pressures. If we look at a solid, the energy is very low. The particles are barely moving. We can consider that they're vibrating around a fixed point. They're also tightly packed. Most solids are crystalline meaning that they are so tightly packed that they adhere to the smallest possible distance between the particles. Because they are so tightly packed, the attractive forces between the atoms and molecules is very strong. This gives solids fixed volumes and shape. One of the other things we can use the kinetic molecular theory for is to explain phase changes. How we go from the phase of solid to liquid to gas. If we think about going from a solid to a liquid, as we increase the temperature, we're increasing the energy in the atoms and molecules. This increase in energy is increasing the kinetic energy of the particles, and they begin to increase in speed. As they start to move, vibrate faster, there'll be a point when they overcome the energy that is keeping the particles attracted to each other. If we think of a liquid to a gas, again, increasing the temperature increases the kinetic energy. The increase in kinetic energy to the point where the attractive forces between the molecules is overcome by the energy of the movement of the particles, there we go from a liquid to a gas. As you can see, if we think about solids, liquids, and gases as particles in motion, we can see how increasing the temperature, which is increasing the kinetic energy, can go from one transition to another. Okay, 
So this is the basic understanding we need to have in mind is that when we think about this, the kinetic molecular theory says that there is an average internal amount of energy that is accelerated in terms of its movement, causing it to change in phase. Now, when that happens, you need to use that to break the intermolecular forces. And so this battle between the forces holding them together and the temperature, which is trying to get them moving faster and which moves them apart, is an ongoing battle. So first we need to explore the forces that exist between the molecules of substance. When the molecules are close together, they're strongly attracted through intermolecular forces. Do not confuse these with intramolecular forces that act within the molecules themselves. That would be your weak and strong nuclear forces that we talked about in the fundamental forces. These are between the molecules that are in the substance. So these forces have different strengths for different molecules. The strength of the intermolecular forces determines what matter exists as solid, liquid, or gas at any particular given temperature. Within all matter, there is a constant competition between temperature and intermolecular forces. And so this is, to me, one of the key takeaways we need to make sure we get today is that there is this ongoing battle that exists between temperature and intermolecular forces. So let's go ahead and highlight this. This is something I want you to make sure that you remember. So star that, okay, it's a competition. Oops, let's undo that and make it cleaner. There is competition between temperature and our intermolecular forces. Okay. So this is your key. So this is back and forth where in this case, temperature is winning. In this case, intermolecular forces, uh, I should call it IMF, okay. Intermolecular forces. And there's kind of this back and forth. If this one wins, the temperature, then you're going to go ahead and see an increase in overall energy in the material, and it's going to more, be more likely in a liquid or gaseous phase. If you see a victory for the intermolecular forces, you're going to see them be more together, which puts them on the lower end of liquid to a solid phase. Okay, So temperature pushes them apart. When temperature wins, they fly apart and become a gas. Intermolecular forces, however, do the opposite. They're going to want them to clump together. And so the stronger the intermolecular forces, the more likely you have a solid. And liquid is kind of somewhere in the middle where they're attracted to each other, but not so attracted that you can't uh, get them to move around each other. Okay. All right. So how strong are these intermolecular forces? Well, it depends on the material. Iron is a solid at room temperature, and water is a liquid at room temperature. What this tells you is that the intermolecular forces between iron atoms are stronger than those between water molecules. In fact, iron is used for building things because it is so strong. The strength of solid iron is another effect of the strong intermolecular forces between iron atoms. So the strength of the material and the attraction of the intermolecular forces are related to each other. So a stronger material will have stronger intermolecular forces. Now let's go back and take a look at our phases of matter again. Matter, remember, is any material substance with mass and volume. And remember, we talked a little bit about volume being the amount of space it takes up and mass we've been using all year, so I won't spend time on it. Matter comes in four states, solid, which has a definite shape and volume, liquid, which has an indefinite shape but a definite volume, gas, which has an indefinite shape and volume, and plasma is a unique one. Most of you have probably heard of it, but this has an indefinite shape and volume like a gas, but flows more like a liquid, okay? So this is a tough one. And as you go from solid down to li liquid to gas to plasma, you are increasing the amount of kinetic energy among the particles that make up the material. So in a solid, we can go ahead and start realizing that they're going to be closely packed. There are two types of solids. We have crystalline solids, like you see here. Your crystalline solids are going to, oops, go back. 
you have your crystalline solids, which have a very uniform pattern in terms of how the particles are related to each other. And you have what are called amorphous solids, which have less organization in terms of their actual particles that make them up. Okay, So these are two terms that you probably should recognize. We won't use them a ton, but it is useful to go ahead and refer to things as a crystalline solid if it is very well organized or to go ahead and recognize it as an amorphous solid where there is less organization in terms of the alignment and structure of the molecules. Okay, all right, so density. Now you probably went over this a lot in your freshman physical science class, but density is the ratio of mass to volume. Again, mass typically going to be given in kilograms, but you could any, use any mass unit and volume typically going to be given in milliliters, but you could use any unit that you want here. Uh, since the energy of the molecules impacts their packing and organization, it's important to understand the impact this has on density. Now, when we start looking at the shapes of molecules and sizes of molecules, you have to think about how many molecules you can fit in a particular space. And this is gonna be related to density. This is a property of solids, liquids, and gases. And the densities of homogeneous materials in the same state of matter are going to be the same, all right? Now, fluids. Fluids are an interesting thing, and I wish we had more time to go over fluids, and we're gonna introduce you to some key concepts in fluids today, but we could easily do an entire unit on fluid dynamics and start looking at everything from buoyancy to Archimedes principle. Uh, go ahead and start looking at viscosity, everything from motor oil to the air resistance that we deal with when we're dealing with flying jets or airplanes. Uh, we could start looking at Bernoulli's principle, looking at lift um, and how airplanes work in terms of gliders or even you know big 747, something like that. Um, We'll introduce them here, but we're not going to have the time to really go into any detail about it. The most common fluid is a liquid, but you have to remember that gases also fit into this category. Plasmas also fit into this category because they move, they flow. Uh, so the only thing that really doesn't in terms of our standard states is going to be a solid because that crystalline or amorphous solid has vibration, but doesn't really move. Okay. Liquids exhibit buoyancy, and buoyancy is a measure of the upward force of a fluid that it exerts on any object you put into it. Uh, keep in mind that since fluids change shape, the forces in fluids are far more complicated than the forces we deal with with solids. So all the mechanics we dealt with last term are trickier when it comes to liquids and fluids, okay? Another important property of fluids is viscosity, and this is the property of fluids that causes friction. So we think about air resistance, that's viscosity of air. Um, you'll hear them talk about this when they're starting to look at motor oils for engines, uh, any fluids that are going in your car. If you were to try and swim in a swimming pool, water has a very different viscosity than if you were to try and swim in maple syrup, um, or if you were trying to swim in oobleck, okay? The behavior of the material with you in it is going to be different. It's much easier to lift yourself in a swimming pool, however, than it is to lift yourself up on land. That buoyancy comes from the differences and densities of the materials. So this is what's called the buoyant force, okay? The upwards force extended by the fluid on whatever is put into it. In the third century BC, a Greek mathematician named Archimedes realized that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of fluid displaced by an object, and this is known as Archimedes' principle. Now, there's a great little TED Ed you can watch on this. I'll go ahead and link it here, but I'm not going to include it in the video. We'll make that optional. Okay. Buoyancy explains why some objects sink and others float. An object floats if the buoyant force is greater than its weight. If the buoyant force is less than its weight, then the object is going to sink. Buoyant forces are created by differences in density. So that's key there, it's the density differences. An object with the same density of water has neutral buoyancy and will be partially above and partially below sitting right at the top of water, okay? Neutral buoyancy occurs when you have equal to the weight of the object and the object is neutrally buoyant. It'll stay immersed in the liquid at a level where it was placed. 
So let's watch a quick little video going over buoyancy. A ship floats because the weight of water it displaces is equal to the weight of the ship. This upward force is called buoyancy and acts to oppose gravity. To control buoyancy, submarines have ballast tanks that can be filled with either air or water. To dive, the ballast tanks are flooded with water and the air is vented out until the density of the submarine is greater than the surrounding water. Submarines surface by forcing compressed air into their ballast tanks. When the ballast tanks are full of air, the submarine is less dense than the surrounding water and it rises to the surface. To maintain a steady depth, the submarine must maintain a balance of air and water in the ballast tanks that is equal to the density of the surrounding water. The salinity, suspended salt and chemicals, and temperature of the water affect its density. If the submarine moves into water that is saltier or colder than the water in its ballast tanks, the sub will tend to rise. Now it's your turn to experience buoyancy firsthand. Step up to the wheel and give it a try. Okay. So you get the general idea of how buoyancy works. Now, buoyancy is actually measured in terms of uh, the SI unit known as the Pascal, okay? And so when we go ahead and start looking at this, uh, the Pascal is a Newton per meter squared, okay? Um, so this is internal pressure that we're, we're measuring here. And so this is a kilogram per meter second squared. So kind of an odd unit, um, but that's what a Pascal is. Now, the air that you breathe is a gas and behaves like a fluid. So is the carbon dioxide that you exhale. And while these gases are fluids, they're different from the liquids that we've been talking about because the molecules of gas are separated from each other because they have a higher internal average kinetic energy and they're able to overcome more of those intermolecular forces. Because those gas molecules act independently though, the gases are free to expand and contract and so they're not locked into a certain volume that we typically talk about with a liquid. And so they can expand to fill their container or they can be compressed into a smaller area. Which leads us to a couple of gas laws. And again, if you do this in chemistry, you'll do this in much more detail, eventually working towards what they call the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. But let's go ahead and start looking at the parts of it, and we'll start relating these different conditions to each other. The first of these is what's known as Boyle's Law. Now, <clears throat> Boyle's Law is relating pressure and volume to each other, okay? So P1 V1 equals P2 V2. And so what you end up seeing is, is that the volume goes down, the pressure has to go up as the volume goes up, the pressure is going to go down because there's that a direct relationship between the two. This is different when we go ahead and take a look at pressure and temperature. Okay, So as the temperature goes up, the pressure goes up. As the temperature goes down, the pressure goes down. And this should make some sense because if we increase the temperature, we're increasing the average internal kinetic energy, which is going to cause the actual particles to run into each other more often, which is creating pressure. I mean, you can think about this too, if you were to go ahead and inflate a bike tire, okay? If it's a hot day out, so the temperature is warmer, the tire actually expands a little bit. If it's a cold day out, the tire actually contracts a little bit and gets smaller. Uh, the easiest way to probably see this is if you ever go tubing. Say you're going to go float down the Willamette River and you go out in the morning and you inflate your tube a lot uh, so that it actually seems really full when you go ahead and put in in the early morning. Well, as you start to float and as the day goes on, the temperature outside begins to rise and the actual inner tube begins to expand and get bigger. OK, 
Okay, so this is typically why when you're going in early in a day when you're expecting it to be hot, you want to underinflate it just a little bit so it has room to go ahead and expand as the temperature increases. The other one that I wanted to introduce you to is what's known as Charles Law. Now, Charles Law is going to relate volume to temperature. Now, this one's a little uh, different. Um, when we go ahead and start looking at it. But like liquids, gases can create buoyant forces. Things can float. If you've ever seen a plastic bag that's floating around up in the breeze, you've already seen this happen. Because gases can flow and has low density, objects of higher density sink quickly. So if you jump up in the air, you fall back down, no problem. Objects, however, that have low density, and this is why we can get a hot air balloon to go up, can go ahead and float. And so a hot air balloon floats because of it has less dense than the surrounding air because we're heating up the air inside the balloon, causing it to go ahead and move faster, which means we're going to have less air per unit area. So the density declines. And so that makes it less dense than the air that is surrounding it. And because the air is less dense inside the balloon than the surrounding air, then it begins to rise. And so you'll see they have the little uh, candle flames, if you want to call it that, the little flame that goes up in towards the balloon. And what that's doing is heating the internal gases so that they become less dense. Okay, And this is an application of Charles' law. Uh, Jacques Charles, the volume of the gases increases with an increase in temperature, and so the volume decreases with decreasing temperature, um, and because of that, it pushes air out of the balloon, making it less dense. The other thing we wanted to talk about is Bernoulli's principle. Now, everything obeys the law of conservation of, everything, of energy. We talked about this in terms of kinetic energy, potential energy, loss of that energy to thermal energy when we were looking at friction, um, law of conservation of energy. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but can be changed in terms of its form. Still true when we deal with fluids, but it's a lot trickier. Uh, you still have potential and kinetic, but you also have what they call pressure energy. If friction is neglected, the total energy stays constant for any particular sample of fluid and that's known as Bernoulli's principle. But this has some somewhat counterintuitive implications in terms of how we see flows of liquids. Okay, So according to Bernoulli's principle, there are three variables, the height of the passageway, the pressure going through that passageway, and the speed. And they're all related by energy conservation. Um, the height is associated with potential energy, just like we did with gravitational potential, speed with kinetic energy, and pressure with what we call pressure energy. If one variable increases along a streamline, uh, at least one of the other two has to decrease. So if speed goes up, pressure has to go down. And what we end up seeing is something along these lines. So it may seem counter in, con, counterintuitive, but when we start sending water from a larger tube down into a smaller tube, it actually is going to go ahead and begin to move through there faster. And so when it moves through there faster, that actually decreases the pressure on the outside of the tube. And at least to most people, that seems pretty counterintuitive. Uh, but this has some pretty cool implications. And if we start thinking about air as a fluid, like we've been talking about in terms of gases, uh, we can actually go ahead and decrease pressure. And because we're decreasing pressure, we can actually go ahead and create a lift force on an airplane. So if the kinetic energy is zero, you have a fluid at rest, then Bernoulli's principle gives us the relationship between pressure and depth. So a bit of fluid that is low or deeper has a higher pressure than one that is high or near the surface. And so what you're gonna see is you're gonna see this pushing upward of any sort of fluid material. And then you can see this, you can actually test this out yourself. If you have a ping pong ball, okay, and a hot air dryer, like uh, for drying your hair, okay. If you go ahead and turn on that hot air dryer or that hair dryer, with the ping pong ball on it, what you're going to see is that it's going to float and hover. And the reason for that is you end up seeing air going not only pushing it upward, but going around the sides. And that's going to go ahead and change the pressures. And you'll end up with this kind of floating effect. Okay, 
Uh, lift is achieved in a very similar way and because of the design of an airplane's wing. As you can see here, okay, the air moves more quickly over the upper curved surface than it does on the bottom. And because of this, the faster movement creates a lower pressure on top. That higher pressure then below the wing is going to force the wing upward, causing it to go ahead and lift or raise the plane. Okay, so let's make sure we understand that and describe some of the properties of gases. So let's go ahead and watch this video. Every minute of every day, you breathe without even thinking about it. Your body does it on its own from the day you're born until the day you die. You have muscles contract to bring oxygen, a gas, into your lungs, which is then transferred by your bloodstream to every cell in your body. Gases are strange. We can't see them, but we know they're there because we can feel them. What we experience as wind is really trillions and trillions of gas molecules slamming into your body. It feels good, right? Science is based on observation. Unfortunately, we cannot observe gases with our eyes. They're too small. We have to use our other senses to make observations and draw conclusions. Observations are then compiled and we create a model. No, not that kind of model. A model is a way scientists describe the properties of physical phenomena. First, gases always move in a straight line. We don't really have anything to demonstrate this with because gravity always pulls objects down. So, imagine a bullet fired from a gun and that bullet goes on at a constant speed in a perfectly straight line. That would be like a gas molecule. Second, gases are so small, they occupy no volume on their own. As a group they do, blow up any balloon and you can see how that volume changes. But single gases have no volume compared to other forms of matter. Rather than calculating such a small amount of matter, we just call it zero for simplicity. Third, if gas molecules collide, and they do, remember these are assumptions, their energy remains constant. An easy way to demonstrate this is by dropping a soccer ball with a tennis ball balanced on top. Because the soccer ball is bigger, it has more potential energy, and the energy from the larger ball is transferred to the smaller tennis ball and it flies away when that energy is transferred. The total energy stays the same. Gases work the same way. If they collide, smaller particles will speed up, larger particles will slow down. The total energy is constant. Fourth, gases do not attract one another and they don't like to touch. But remember rule three, in reality they do collide. Finally, gases have energy that is proportional to the temperature. The higher the temperature, the higher the energy the gases have. The crazy thing is that at the same temperature, all gases have the same energy. It doesn't depend on the type of gas, just the temperature that gas is at. Keep in mind, this is a model for the way gas particles behave, and based on our observations, gases always move in straight lines. They're so small that they're not measurable on their own, and they don't interact with one another. But if they do bump into one another, that energy is transferred from one particle to another, and the total amount never changes. Temperature has a major effect, and in fact, all gases at the same temperature have the same average energy. Whew, I need to go catch my breath. Okay, so some interesting properties to kind of keep in mind, and we have to think about how this works with respect to the kinetic molecular theory. So typically when we start looking at heat and the impact on materials, we start realizing that some are going to take on that heat faster and change phases more quickly, and so that's what we're going to call specific heat, and we'll go ahead and talk about that next class. But what we want to also think about is the fact that how can gases that are all at the same temperature go ahead and behave with the same amount of energy? So this is, this is a little counterintuitive too, and so this is a little tricky. Now, if you wanna get an idea about how the molecules are transferring energy during collisions, uh, go ahead and try the demonstration that they talked about with the soccer ball and the tennis ball and go ahead and drop them with one attached to the other and watch what happens to the tennis ball. You can start seeing that this obeys, minus friction again, uh, our law of conservation of energy when we start looking at a, an elastic transmission in terms of how those things work. You could use your, uh, your um, explosion equation to go ahead and talk about that in terms of it being a closed system. All right, so we have a general idea of how 
properties of gases work. Um, let's talk a little bit about plasma because I've largely avoided it here. And it's probably the most common state of matter in the known universe. The difference is, is that we don't really deal with plasma much here on Earth. We're mostly dealing with solid, liquid, and gas. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at plasma. Hi, I'm Emerald Robinson, and in this What Is video, we're going to investigate the state of matter called plasma. Plasma is the state of matter that consists of a mass of free electrons and positively charged particles called cations mixed together. Plasma has neither a specific shape nor Remember, a consistent volume. Remember, cations are positive In other ions. words, plasma can easily flow into and take the shape of a container and will expand, redistributing itself to evenly fill that container. Although the properties of plasma are similar to those of gases, plasma and gases are not the same thing. In plasma, electrons are released from their orbits around a nucleus, creating a soup of free electrons and nuclei. Because these charged particles are loose, plasma easily conducts electricity and both produces and responds to magnetic fields. Plasma is created when a gas is either exposed to a high temperature or when high voltage electricity is passed through it. The heat or electricity makes the atoms in the gas move so quickly and collide so violently with one another that electrons are knocked from their orbits. Because of the way they are created, plasmas are sometimes called ionized gases. Although plasma isn't discussed as often as solids, liquids, and gases, and was the last phase of matter discovered, you're probably more familiar with plasma than you think. Plasma gives neon and fluorescent lights their glow, is formed during lightning strikes, and of course is present in plasma televisions. Chemists also classify fire as a plasma. Plasma makes up our sun and is visible in the solar flares that erupt from its surface. Because plasma is the stuff of stars, it is the most common state of matter, making up about 99% of the observable universe. Okay, so some cool little things to know about plasma. Now, in some respects, she's right, and it was the last naturally occurring state of matter that we've discovered. However, since then, we have identified one more state of matter, which is not really common in the universe um, at all. In fact, the only place we know that it exists is the places where we've made it. And this is on the opposite end. So if you add a whole bunch of heat to a gas and it becomes a plasma, if you remove a whole bunch of heat from a solid, then it becomes a Bose-Einstein condensate. And so this is the last video we'll show you. You'll get an idea of how this works, and then we'll call it for today. I'm about to meet a scientist who can't be bothered with hundredths or even thousandths of a degree for that matter, AKA a millikelvin. We, we are bored by millikelvin. We like to go to nanokelvin. That is- Nanokelvin? Nanokelvin. That would be a billionth of a degree. A about billionth of absolute zero. It's very, very cold. It's a million times colder than interstellar space. It's just about the lowest temperature ever reached. A place so clear and cold, physicists can see the fundamental laws of nature in action. MIT's Martin Zvirlein is going to use sodium atoms to show me how to get there, the final frontier of cold. Wow, and so how do you do that? So we can uh, start over there at the oven? The oven. Step one, cook up some sodium atoms, the same kind in your table salt, to about 700 degrees Fahrenheit. That way you can separate them. You want to get single atoms to play with, single sodium atoms, lots of them, yeah. a whole stream of them. Step two, hit them with lasers. I know you MIT guys have the reputation of being very smart, but I have a little tip for you. Lasers are hot. Ooh. You might be yeah. a little backwards there. Yeah, you might think about Star Trek where they kill people with lasers. Turns out here, we cool atoms down with lasers and they get a recall from it. Just if you hit a billiard ball with another billiard ball. In other words, when you hit atoms with just the right amount of laser light, it acts like a little shove in the opposite direction that the atom is moving, slowing it down. If you look down here, you will actually see the cold cloud right there in the center of the vacuum chamber. So that glowing star thing? It looks, it looks like the sun. It, it ought to be super, super hot. No, it's actually extremely cold. Those are a billion atoms cooled to a millikelvin. A thousandth of a degree above absolute zero. But lasers can get us only so far. You cannot reach the nanokelvin temperatures just with laser cooling. 
So we need another technique. Which brings us to step three. Get out your coffee cup. What takes over after laser cooling is what we call evaporative cooling. It's the same thing that happens to your coffee right now because it's just cooling down. So if you now force it a little bit by blowing on the coffee, uh, you speed that process up. The coffee gets cold more quickly. That's exactly what we do here. But instead of a coffee cup, Zierlein uses a cup made of magnetic fields to trap his atoms. Then he blows on it with radiation and lowers the rim of the cup to let the hotter atoms escape. So now we're going to do this coffee cup cooling. It's going to bring us to nano Kelvin. OK, ready for this? Yes. Let's do this. All right. So can you please switch on this stuff? Do this. This is great. Let's switch on this guy. And then this awesome knob here. Press the awesome white button. Fantastic. <laughs> so that's good. Please press F12. Always button. wondered what F12 does. So you see now the atoms are cooling because the cloud size gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And here you see the temperature drop, 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 drop. Oh, wow. It takes a few minutes, but eventually the atoms become so cold, they lose their individual identities altogether and coalesce into that new state of matter called a Bose-Einstein condensate. Wait a minute, wait a minute. OK, so yes. that's the condensate? That's the condensate. But look at the temperature. Yeah, it's very cold. 177 <laughs> billionths. Billionths of a degree. 177 billionths of a degree Kelvin. This is the coldest spot in the universe right now. That's right amazing. Here. So not even in outer space? No, no, no. Outer space is a million times hotter. Not the dark side of the moon? No, it's like all hot. Comets? Terrible, yeah. Black holes, yeah. Nothing. nothing. This is it, this in, is this, it. in this room. Yes. That's amazing. I, yeah. I would ask its autograph if I could. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not about setting obscure records. What Zvirline is excited about is what these exotic states of matter can teach us about the universe. Our puff of gas teaches us about the neutron stars, or split second after the Big Bang. There was this weird form of matter called the core gluon plasma. A super hot type of matter in the early universe that would give rise to everything we see today. So you're telling me that this tiny freezing cold dot can teach us something about enormous blazing hot stuff. That's the fun part of physics. It connects these very different areas. The very hot, very cold, everything is governed by the same laws. Amazingly, what happens at these ultra-cold temperatures is that atoms get so smeared out, their waves start looking indistinguishable from those of super-hot particles under extreme pressure. Like those inside the inner core of neutron stars. So dense, a teaspoon of them weighs 10 billion tons. Zvirlein and others can now simulate substances like this in their labs and probe their mysteries. That's incredible. And then in a couple more years, you'll finally do it. You'll hit 0.0, .0 absolute zero, and we'll be done. Yeah, unfortunately, it's never possible to reach absolute zero. What? You know, there's always going to be a little, little drop of energy sitting around somewhere. Turns out it's impossible to get to absolute zero, because no matter how cold you get, Everything has tiny quantum jitters. And where you have motion, even a tiny amount, you have heat. But that's not stopping scientists from getting even colder to explore the fundamental laws of nature and how our universe came to be. Just the way noise can drown out music, heat is like the noise that obscures things. If you get things really, really cold, you sort of drown out, you damp down all the noise, and you can listen to what nature is whispering to you. OK, guys, so pretty crazy. And so now you see that the very cold end actually ties back in some respect to the very hot end uh, in terms of how the states of matter behave. And we start losing our particle properties and behaving somewhat like a wave. And we'll talk more about waves in our next unit. All right, guys, stay safe, stay healthy, take care of yourselves, and I'll talk to you soon. So long.